Ray Mabus to be Navy Secretary. Mr. Mabus served as Governor of Mississippi from 1988 to 1992 and also as the U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia. That hearing will be chaired by Michigan Senator Carl Levin. It begins at 9 a.m. Eastern. Now a hearing examining the U.S. trade embargo with Cuba. Members heard from witnesses on the potential economic impact of normalized trade relations between the two countries. This hearing was held by the House Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection. It's two and a half hours. The subcommittee will come to order. Uh, this is a subcommittee hearing on examining the status of U.S. trade with Cuba and its impact on economic growth. And the chair will recognize himself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. I want to thank the members of the subcommittee for participating in the first trade hearing on Cuba in the 111th Congress. I recently visited Cuba with my colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus. We met with President Raul Castro and our chairman, Barbara Lee, and I personally met with former Cuba uh, President Fidel Castro along with uh, Congresswoman Julia Richardson from California. A lot has been said and written about that trip to Cuba and about that meeting. Uh, because of travel restrictions, many Americans don't know what Cuba has become. What I witnessed there compelled me to call this hearing to assess U.S. trade policies toward Cuba. I believe our current trade policy with Cuba is a failure. We must reevaluate our trade policy's impact on both the Cuban and the American people. I strongly believe that expanding and diversifying our exports to Cuba will be beneficial for both countries. Some argue the current embargo should be maintained as a political tool that has proved to be effective, as was the case with South Africa. However, I must say that the current embargo on Cuba is not a multilateral uh, embargo, and we're in a different political and economic environment today. Unilateral sanctions are usually problematic and ineffective. Congress has opened, as Cuba has opened its doors to the entire world, and the world has walked steadily in. All nations in the Americas, except the U.S., have resumed diplomatic relations with Cuba. All of our economic competitors, including China and Brazil and Mexico, Japan, Canada, and the European Union are currently trading with Cuba. Cuba has also made it clear that the same doors are open to the U.S., and our policy should not prevent American companies from doing business with the Cuban people. We are looking for new markets to penetrate. Our companies want to complete, compete globally, and our unemployed workers want jobs. Now is not the time to ignore all of the opportunities that are presented to us. And I believe that Cuba should be treated like other trading partners with similar political and economic conditions. Liberalizing trade with Cuba is not without precedent, precedent and has already proven beneficial to both the U.S. and the Cuban people. In 2000, when I and other members of Congress voted to approve a modest opening of trade, the overall exports to Cuba rose from $7 million in 2001 to $404 million in 2004. However, I must add, the so-called cash-in-advance rule initiated by the previous administration in 2005 has complicated an already difficult process and caused Cuba to cut back on its imports from the U.S. Nonetheless, the United States has been Cuba's largest supplier of food and agricultural products, with almost $2.7 billion in total sales. 
Having said all of this, I am not naive, nor am I blind to Cuba's challenges. It is undeniable that Cuba has serious political, economic, financial, and social problems. Like many developing countries, Cuba has many regulatory hurdles. To be sure, political and economic reform must be initiated by Havana inside Cuba's borders. However, it is also undeniable that some progress has been made and that the embargo in many instances has actually increased the suffering of the very people we are trying to assist. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, approximately 28 nations have undergone transitions from communist regimes. Countries that were less isolated from the West achieved more successful and prosperous democracies than those that were isolated. I believe that Cuba can make a similar transformation if we fully engage the island nation in the global economy. I commend our president for his leadership in easing the current restrictions on Cuba. This is the first step in the right direction. I support a more rapid move to towards normalization of our trading relationships with Cuba. Today's hearing is just a beginning in a series of steps that I intend to take to do all I can to both open up markets for U.S. commerce, especially for small minority and women-owned businesses, while also at the same time to help bring liberty and prosperity to the Cuban people. Now, I yield back the balance of my time and now I recognize the ranking member of this subcommittee, uh, Congressman Rodonovich, for five minutes for the purposes of opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this important hearing to examine our trade relations with Cuba. Appreciate it. This subcommittee's jurisdiction includes non-tariff barriers to trade. As we saw in an earlier hearing in the subcommittee that examined ways to promote our exports to help our economy, increasing our trade exports to revive our economy as a path that we should pursue. We manufacture many world-class goods and services the world will buy if given a chance. Today we examine quite a different topic, Cuba and our special situation with that country. Our embargo on trade with Cuba, except for food and medicine, is a long-standing policy I support due to the Castro regime that has been in power for over 50 years. President Obama has indicated a desire to go down a path to change that policy, including incremental changes to permit remittances and travel by Cuban Americans back to Cuba, back to Cuba to visit their family. Other pundits have suggested that we go further to normalize relations. I believe that there would, that would be a mistake until the people of Cuba are free. If that time comes, I would fully support a change in the policy. Our agricultural exports would find a receptive market, particularly in Cuba where about 80 percent of its food supply <clears throat> is imported and the country would be a natural destination for our fruits and vegetables, among other products. Unfortunately, the tyrannical oppression continues and, pers and to pursue trade with Cuba is a major affront to those who have given their lives for the freedom of this Caribbean nation. I cannot justify in good conscience a change in policy that may produce marginal increases at best to our economy, and those benefits are quite questionable. It is true that the embargo has not yet affected the, the bipartisan policy goal of regime change, but it is equally true that foreign investment and normal trade relations with Cuba by other developed nations has not produced any change. If we turn a blind eye and set aside our leadership as the world's promoter of democracy and freedom to follow in the footsteps of others, what do we expect will occur? Thus far, the Castros have been able to use trade with other countries to further their own goals and enrich themselves without benefit to the people that they proclaim to care so much about. The Castros care so much, they do not tolerate political dissidents, they su suppress free speech, and limit religious expression, including the establishment of religion-based religion schools. Since they assumed power, religion has been suppressed because it was counter-revolutionary. In short, a Cuban citizen has limited control over his own being because that right has been taken by the Castro brothers. In one of the truly humanitarian exchanges after Raul Castro took over, 
Cuban citizens were permitted greater freedom to move within their own country. Can anyone here imagine not being able to travel freely within our borders or send your child to a school of your choice? Well, maybe we can imagine that given the administration's recent decision to eliminate school vouchers for children in D.C., if you have the money to send your children to an elite private school, I guess that you don't have to worry about vouchers for others. Many would like to see the travel ban to Cuba lifted completely from a purely substantive point regarding its effect on our economy that will provide little or no, would provide little to our GDP and may even hurt our own domestic travel industry. Let's remember travel and tourism to the United States is one of our better exports that generates many jobs. Taking steps that would permit a one-way street permitting travel to Cuba without reciprocity would adversely hinder our balance of trade as we import more tourism. Add to that the sub substitution effect of diverting travel to Cuba that might otherwise have flowed to Florida or other domestic destinations, and I can only see us losing economically. In short, increased travel and tourism may only hurt our domestic tourism industry without benefit to the Cuban people while simultaneously filling the coffers of the Castros. Telecommunications is also viewed as a possible avenue to export more products, but doing business in Cuba requires a joint venture with the Castro government. Whether the net effect would be positive is debatable. Certainly other countries that do not maintain a trade embargo with Cuba have been free to expand their markets in Cuba. However, democracy advocates have yet to see the benefits of those ventures. This may be due in part to the very limited financial resources of the average Cuban citizen and the affordability of telecommunication services. Why anyone thinks that this will change if a company providing the service in a US as a U.S. company rather than their current provider escapes me. As long as the Castros maintain a regime which represses individual freedom, oppresses dissenting political views, and expresses hostility toward religious expression, while at the same time maintaining a state-controlled economy to the benefit of the Castro family and their adherents, further trade relations beyond humanitarian aid in the name of making a buck is an injustice to the Cuban people and their brave freedom advocates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the fine gentleman from Maryland, Mr. S Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes for the uh, purposes of an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly don't need five minutes. Um, I'm in a learning mode today. I'm looking forward uh, to the hearing. I appreciate your convening it. Obviously, the economic embargo on Cuba is a delicate topic. Um, it seems to become more delicate every, delicate every day, and, and more people are coming to the discussion. You've rightly uh, acknowledged the, the human rights concerns that exist, but you've also noted the arguments for modifying or even eliminating that embargo, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing the discussion today. I yield back my time. Thank you. The chair now recognizes my friend, the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingrich, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. I, I want to thank you for calling the hearing today on this important issue of the current trade embargo with Cuba and its economic impact on our country. In the face of our current economic struggles, our responsibility is to, to bolster the United States economy by expanding trade in a fair and open way that creates jobs domestically, and of course we look for every opportunity to do that. Uh, however, trade policy is not just economic, as we all know, but of course it's also foreign policy. In the case of Cuba, the lure of trade with the United States must be heavily conditioned on the improvement of human rights in that country. In fact, the oppressive communist Castro regime has a widespread history of human rights violations and is currently listed, currently listed as a state sponsor of terrorism by our State Department. Therefore, I have supported and I will continue to support the embargo. And I do not believe that the United States should lift this embargo until, until Cuba makes significant reforms that expand freedom and civil liberties for its citizens. Over the past decade, there have been some concessions that have been made for humanitarian purposes, including remittances for family members of Cuban Americans, as well as restricted travel for immediate family. Most recently, 
the fiscal year 2009 Omnibus Appropriations Act made some more modifications to existing travel restrictions, uh, and the Obama administration has called for additional changes to remittances. But these need to be closely monitored so that they benefit the people of Cuba and not just the Castros and the Castro government. In the nearly 50 years that this embargo has been in place, there is one question that remains. Will Cuba trade with the United States improve political and economic conditions for the Cuban citizens, or will it simply reward and endorse the oppressive communist government run by both Fidel and Raul Castro? In the intervening time, we have seen a number of our allies in the Western Hemisphere. This has been said by chairman and ranking member, uh, and Europe as well openly trade with Cuba, yet Cuba has made very little improvement in human rights conditions despite this open trade. For these reasons, I believe that the federal government and this subcommittee in particular needs to proceed very cautiously as we hear testimony today and we debate future ramifications of trade with Cuba. Uh, you know, I look forward to hearing from the both panel of witnesses and uh, uh, at this time, I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to uh, having an opportunity to question the witnesses. The Chair, certainly thanks to the gentleman from Georgia. And now it is my pleasure uh, and honor to welcome uh, to this subcommittee's hearing <clears throat> two fine public servants, uh, both who are employees of the Department of Commerce. Uh, the one, Mr. Walter Bastian, <clears throat> is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Western Hemisphere, the International Trade Administration. Uh, Mr. Bastian, I want to welcome you and I want to thank you for appearing before the subcommittee and taking the time out from your busy schedule to share your thoughts with us. Our next witness on this first panel is the uh, is Mr. Matthew Borman, a fine gentleman from the uh, Department of Commerce, uh, Bureau of Industry and Security. His former title is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Export Administration. Uh, Mr. Borman, I, again, my thoughts are certainly gracious, and we want to thank you so much for being here uh, and participating in this hearing. Uh, we will ask, if you will, because it has been a policy, a new policy of the subcommittee, that you be sworn in uh, for the purposes of giving an opening statement and participating in this hearing. So would you please uh, raise your right hand, stand and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please let, please take your seats. Uh, please let the record reflect that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Bastian, we'll ask that you uh, provide us with an opening statement, and you can restrict your statement, if you will, to five minutes. I say more or less, five minutes. Thank you. There we go. Sorry. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Radanovich, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today concerning recent events in our relationship with Cuba. I welcome your interest in this topic. Today's hearing is entitled Examining the Status of U.S. Trade with Cuba and its Impact on Economic Growth. But I can imagine that the interest of committee members extend not only to that subject, but also to the President's recent statements regarding his belief that we can move the U.S.-Cuba relations in a new direction. It is my hope that members will take no offense if I do not take this opportunity to expand upon nor to interpret the words and messages the President so capably laid out during the successful Summit of the Americas in Trinidad and Tobago. We meet at a fluid moment in U.S. policy and, as members of this committee know, setting U.S. policy towards Cuba is not within the province of the Department of Commerce. On April 13th of this year, 
The President directed the Secretaries of Commerce, Treasury, and State to take actions necessary to lift restrictions on family visits to Cuba, remove restrictions on remittances to family members, authorize greater telecommunications links with Cuba, and expand the scope of humanitarian donations eligible for export. These changes in our Cuba policy are designed to encourage greater contact between family members, ease the flow of remittances to Cuban families, and promote the flow of information to the Cuban people. The Bureau of Industry and Security, BIS, at the Department of Commerce and Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, are hard at work implementing these policy changes. My colleague from the Bureau of Industry and Security will discuss these changes in more detail in his testimony. Reaching out to the Cuban people in this way is a demonstration of our interest in setting our relations with Cuba on a more productive <coughs> and positive course. The actions we are taking will directly benefit the well-being of Cuban citizens and will remove barriers between families in both countries. Mr. Chairman, I understand that you recently returned from a visit to the island and that you, as well as a number of your colleagues, are interested in greater commercial interchange with Cuba. As you know, the United States maintains extensive legal restrictions on the ability of U.S. firms to trade with Cuba. The President has indicated his belief that the embargo should remain in place as a source of leverage for positive change in Cuba. I will very briefly delineate the mix of legislation that governs our trade relations with Cuba. The United States maintains a comprehensive trade embargo with respect to Cuba under numerous laws. That embargo was first announced by President Kennedy in Presidential Proclamation 3447 in 1962 under the authority of the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961. Implementing regulations issued by the Department of Commerce and the Department of Treasury to carry out the trade embargo on Cuba relied on general authorities in the Export Control Act of 1949 and the Trading with the Enemy Act. The trade embargo on Cuba has been further shaped over the years by various pieces of legislation, including the Export Administration Act of 1979, the Cuban Democracy Act of 1992, and the Cuban Liberty and Democratic Solidarity, otherwise Libertad, Act of 1996, and the Trade Sanctions Reform and Export Enhancement Act, TSRA, of 2000. TSRA limits commerce's ability to promote and support U.S.-Cuba trade. Under TSRA, the Department is prohibited from providing the routine export assistance to U.S. exporters to Cuba that our U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service regularly provides to other U.S. firms. Despite the broad restrictions on trade with Cuba, U.S. producers exported more than $700 million in agricultural goods to Cuba in 2008, making US, the U.S. the largest source of food to Cuba and making us Cuba's fifth largest trading partner. Conclusion. President Obama indicated at the Summit of the Americas that the United States seeks a new beginning in its relations with Cuba. The measures announced on April 13th were intended as a signal to the people of Cuba and to the government of Cuba that the United States is prepared to pursue po policies that will strengthen the ties between the people in our countries and bolster progress toward a free and democratic Cuba. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you or other members of the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Bastian. And now we will recognize Mr. Borman for five minutes more or less. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, member Radonovich, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I also appreciate the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today to discuss the Bureau of Industry and Security's role in implementing the U.S. trade embargo on Cuba. I also ask that my written statement be included in the record. So on it. As my colleague, uh, Mr. Bastian, has already outlined, there are, are, are a welter of uh, laws and regulations that govern our trade, trade with Cuba, and I won't uh, enumerate them again. Um, I would point out that, um, in particular, the Libertad Act, uh, among other things, codifies the trade embargo on Cuba, and, and it requires that the embargo remain in effect unless certain conditions are met, most notably either there's a transition government in, in place or there's already been a democratically elected government. So the Libertad Act codifies much of the current embargo. Having said that, of course, though, the President and all Presidents retain some discretion to make exceptions to the embargo. 
and as a result of that, that uh, discretionary authority, the Commerce Department has the authority to issue licenses for particular transactions or general authorizations for, for particular types of transactions under certain conditions. And, and as uh, Mr. Bastian has already noted, the Bureau of Industry and Security regulates the export of commodities, software, and technology to Cuba, while the Office of Foreign Assets Control Department of Treasury regulates all transactions with Cuba, including the financing related to exports. So we at BIS handle things going to Cuba, and Treasury handles essentially everything else, all other interactions between the U.S. and Cuba. We do ours through the Export Administration regulations. Treasury has a separate set of their own regulations. Now, pursuant to the laws and regulations, almost everything in the U.S. economy needs a license, an individual authorization to go to Cuba, and there's a, currently a general policy of denial for most items going to Cuba under the existing embargo. Notwithstanding that general policy of denial, however, in 2008, we at BIS processed 358 applications for licenses to export to Cuba, and of those 358 applications, 235 were approved, 114 were returned without action, and eight, nine were denied. The total dollar value of those approved licenses uh, was about one and a half billion dollars. And in addition to those individual licenses, we also processed 151 notices of agricultural exports to Cuba. This is a particular license exception we have implemented pursuant to the Trade Sanctions Reform Act, or TISRA as we call it. Of those, one, of those 151 that we processed last year, uh, 143 were approved, and they were worth about $3.2 billion, and uh, the remaining eight were returned without action. So those are the authorizations that we at BIS uh, authorized individually and under the TISRA exemption. Uh, one other thing I would point out is that these authorizations include about $95 million of exports that we authorized in the last quarter of 2008 for hurricane relief specifically, and we did those in an average processing time of five days which, as you can imagine, in a government bureaucracy is quite fast. <laughs> quite impressive. Um, now a word about the pending uh, revisions to our regulations at BIS based on the President's announcement. As, as, as Mr. Bastian noted, the President directed the Secretary of Commerce in particular to further expand the scope of the license exception, that is the general authorization, regarding gifts, gift parcels to Cuba. A uh, wider variety of items will become available to be included in the gift parcels. The dollar value for the gift parcels will go up from $400 to $800, and the universe of recipients will be expanded, although there will still be no gift parcels permitted to either high government officials, Communist Party members, or institutions or organizations controlled by either the government or the party. We will also establish a, um, a new license exception for uh, consumer communications devices, uh, cell phones, satellite phones, personal digital assistants, digital cameras, again, to further the free flow of information between the United States and the Cuban people and among the Cuban people. And the last change that we'll implement as a result of the President's decision is to lift the uh, personal baggage limitation. Currently, there's a limit of 44 pounds per person to take with them to Cuba. When we uh, finalize our regulation implementing the President's directive, that limitation will be removed. So that's what we're doing to implement the President's directive. Um, in conclusion, I just would say again that what we do is, is largely governed by statute as well as regulation, and we continue to work with our interagency partners, principally the State Department in this area, to implement the President's direction, directive to meet the basic human needs of the Cuban people and facilitate contacts between the American people and the Cuban people. And with that, I conclude my oral statement, and also I'm happy to answer questions. The chair thanks the gentleman, and indeed the chair thanks both of the witnesses for their fine uh, statements. <clears throat> uh, the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for the purposes of questioning these witnesses. Uh, <clears throat> because of uh, Cuba's, oh, no, let me strike that. Because of the U.S.'s unilateral embargo, we sometimes assume Cuba's economy is cut off from the world. Uh, that certainly has not been the case, uh, from my understanding. Investors from all over the world operate joint ventures in Cuba. 
countries like Venezuela, Brazil, China, Vietnam extend credit to Cuba. Indeed, a Spanish company is lending, is leading an effort to, to drill for oil in Cuba's territorial waters this year, if I am not mistaken. And I believe that American companies should be afforded the same investment opportunities in Cuba. Now, let me ask both of the witnesses. Uh, what do you foresee happening if the U.S. normalizes its trade relations with Cuba? Can you uh, indicate what markets would be right for entry in the uh, U.S. Uh, for the U.S.? What markets are, are there that American companies might be able to penetrate most readily and most thoroughly if, in fact, we were normalized trade relationships? Uh, Mr. Bastian, would you please begin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you might imagine, we don't have an awful lot of information on, on uh, the specific needs of, of uh, Cuba insofar as business is concerned. Uh, we don't share information uh, with uh, our trading partners, other trading partners, principally because we don't trade with Cuba to begin with. But I think it's a pretty safe assumption to say that um, in the areas of infrastructure, I think we've already covered, for, as an example, briefly telecommunications, but I think if you took a look at general infrastructure, about transportation equipment, port handling equipment, things of that nature, uh, ports, railroads, uh, airports, things of that nature, I think would offer some significant, probably opportunity to, to U.S. business, certainly things that we would be taking a look at. But, you know, and keep in mind also that uh, at the moment we do have a, we're the fifth largest supplier to Cuba. Uh, of uh, product, not manufactured goods necessarily, except maybe some in the medical field, but basically agricultural goods. But I, th I think if we took a look initially at those sectors, how do you move goods across the island to reach the Cuban people, I think those would be essentials to look at. In addition to what uh, Mr. Bastian said, I think based on the data available to us, some of the other areas that would have some potential would be uh, food processing, handling, distribution, and as he said, in the medical area. Last year we licensed about 47 uh, individual transactions for medical sales to Cuba uh, worth about $64 million. So I think that would be another area. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an estimate for the <clears throat> lost business opportunities uh, that have occurred as a result of the embargo. How many U.S. How much many business opportunities has U.S. companies lost as a result of the embargo? You got an estimate, or Mr. And Chairman? I think the, the, the really short answer is no. We don't. Okay. Um, again, we, we clearly are not approached by U.S. companies that are you know say you know I could have sold so much to Cuba that we have not uh, gotten. So the, I think you could probably take a look at maybe, there was a really old study done, I think by the ITC back at about around, I think 2001 in, in, in that time frame there, but the data of course is, in that case is eight years old. So, but it might give you an uh, indication. Um, and, but beyond that, um, I'm not aware of any information that's out there that talks about Sales foregone. Okay, Mr. Borman. Yes, I don't have any other information on that, Mr. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, if the uh, embargo were lifted, uh, what do you believe would be the um, impact in Cuba? Will the uh, Cuban people see a difference in their daily lives if the Cuban government still controls the distribution of goods? And secondly, how can we be assured that the Cuban government will grant the appropriate licenses and other authorizations to American companies to do business? Do you have any information? Can you help us along with uh, an answer to those questions? Mr. Bastian? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speculation is very difficult and sure. sometimes pretty dangerous thing to, uh, yeah. to get into. Um, but I, th I think you did mention something that, that's absolutely key, and that is this is a... Uh, 
two-way street. The president, as an example, has announced some measures, uh, is, is interested in pursuing those, and what we need to do is to find a, basically a partner for that dance uh, that will uh, make uh, show a willingness to, to uh, continue this, uh, this course of action. I think that would probably be my response. The only thing I, I would add to that is uh, obviously a lot of the uh, impact would be dependent upon the uh, funds available to the Cuban people to actually purchase U.S. goods on a commercial basis, um, and so that's that's a that's a, bi a big unknown at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, uh, my time is up, uh, and now I will yield uh, for the purposes of questioning five minutes to the ranking member. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and again, welcome to the subcommittee. Uh, Mr. Bastian, I wanted to, I, I was noticed in your testimony on the amount of agricultural exports um, that occurred in trade between the U.S. and Cuba in 2008 was $700 million. Can you give me an idea of how much that might do, uh, be, that, that amount might be due to an increase in um, commodity prices, as, as you'll recall? Last year, uh, some of those export prices were rather high. Uh, I can't give. I, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. I'll get it for you. But I, I think that the you're absolutely right because it was a significant jump uh, in, in dollar amount mm -hmm. uh, over the last couple of years, uh, due in large measure to to commodity prices. If there were a way to get the the, the information to the committee uh, to measure increase in Exports in uh, in, in real terms something other than dollars. Okay, I, I understand, sir. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that back to you. All right, thank you. Also, um, the Castro regime confiscated many businesses and took intellectual property such, such as trademarks when they took over power and claimed they now um, claimed that they now own those properties. How does the U.S. address trade policy with countries that don't honor property rights? Okay, I, I do. Uh, <coughs> I believe that that's a question that really does need to be directed to the State Department on, on, on that. Mm -hmm. But you, if I might, you, you do bring in an interesting point, which is lifting the restrictions on Cuba on trade uh, is, is part of what needs to be done. I think the other part of the things that you referred to, I think you mentioned in the beginning, your interest in non-tariff barriers. Uh, and I think there's a whole host of issues that we would need to take a look at there if we're going to get the maximum benefit for U.S. companies. Perhaps you can ask, ask this, I, I would like to ask, that how, how should we deal with Cuba regarding our company's intellectual property given the profits Cuba has, been, has made selling confiscated property of former Cuban companies, usually in the form of rum or cigars? I think we'd have to take a, a real hard look at that. And these are some of the issues, among others, that we would have to take a look at and, and get resolution to, I think, before we can... Uh, move forward is that it also brings up the whole question of when you're talking about intellectual property about the the security for you know potential future investors in the island they said there are a host of issues we need to take a look at the ones that you deal with mm -hmm. all right thank you mr bastian mr um, borman uh, the bis is working on a regulatory change to implement the directive to permit license exemptions for donations of personal communications devices to cuban citizens but not to the Cuban government. How can we ensure that the donations are not confiscated or redirected to the government? Well, that really will depend on um, the, the knowledge people have of the individuals getting it and then various ways of feedback we have. You know, we, we don't have a way to go in and necessarily check on individual items once they're there, but there are a variety of other information sources we have that will help us assess that. Okay. Have you defined what, it, what a personal communications device is? Yes, it's something that's really in retail sale. Um, so as I mentioned, it's things like personal digital assistants, uh, mobile phones, satellite phones, laptop, desktop computers, digital cameras. Mm -hmm. Certainly nothing um, above a personal consumer level, nothing that businesses or governments would really use in any significant way. Okay. About uh, one-third of license applications that you received in 2008 were returned without action. Why were the applications returned? 
for one of two reasons. In, in some cases, licenses were not actually needed. There is a narrow strata of, of items like agricultural exports where you don't need an individual license. And, and the other group it would be ones that there's simply not enough information on. So, for example, the license application, I mean, there's just not enough information on the proposed end user in Cuba for the U.S. government to make an informed decision. And so we return that saying, essentially, you can't ship unless you come in and give us more information. Got it. All right. Um, Mr. Bastian, one, one last question. As long as the embargo is the official U.S. policy, where do the companies that are permitted to export agriculture and medical products receive export assistance? Um, they don't. Uh, the, we're talking about uh, sales of agricultural commodities, which is basically cash in advance from, the, uh, from Cuba. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you very much. I'll yield back yes, to balance my time. The chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll, we'll allow you five minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess the U.S. Uh, embargo is the most restrictive trade embargo on Cuba in the world, right? Well, we do have fairly restrictive uh, trade policies in some other countries, Iran, Syria, North Korea. No, no, but I mean, there's no other country in terms of imposing an embargo against Cuba that comes oh, near to what to other countries. Right. What is the next most restrictive trade policy imposed on Cuba by another country that you would Is there any? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of what other countries' policies are. Um, we've talked about this distinction between the government and the people and steps that can be taken to try to ease some of the or promote more interaction with the people of Cuba as opposed to with the government. Um, which is tricky. It's tricky when we try to make that distinction in a lot of places. And I can think of a number of other examples. But are there, and some of this has to do with just allowing um, dollars and resources to flow straight to residents of Cuba. But are there, is there, is there any kind of NGO infrastructure or other ways of getting resources to the people um, as opposed to the government, and after you comment on that, could you describe the impediments that the government might present to having that happen? Well, certainly on the NGO side, there are some NGOs that have a fairly uh, well-established track record of operating within Cuba, and in fact, particularly on the medical side, uh, the medical donations we authorize are really through those organizations. Um, and. I suppose there's always a possibility that the government will decide to do things differently, um, but but I think there's enough information flow in and out of Cuba that it'll be fairly apparent if the government decides to do things in a more restrictive way than they're currently doing in terms of letting those NGOs receive things from donors in the U.S. and distribute them directly to the people. Are there restrictions on, on the NGO activity that that you know of now that that exists that would where if they if they um, ease those that would be a kind of leading indicator that the that the government is dealing in a different way with that kind of humanitarian assistance and other assistance. I that I don't have an answer to, but we can check on that and get back to you on that. Okay, I appreciate that. And the steps that the president took or or asked um, people to take uh, just recently. Um, in terms of lifting certain restrictions. Are, are any of those ones that um, had been eased in the past and then tightened again, or the, would you view them all as, as new in either kind or degree? On the gift parcels and the baggage, those were effectively changes to tightenings that were made in the previous administration. Okay. The donations of consumer communication devices, that's a new uh, license exception. Okay. Thank you. I yield back my time. 
And the chair thanks the gentleman. Now the chair uh, recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingrey, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Uh, you know, we're going to hear uh, from the second panel in a few minutes. Uh, and I was just reading uh, the, the testimony from the United States Chamber of Commerce. And a statement is made in their conclusion regarding the embargo that's gone on for the past 50 years. Instead of isolating Cuba from the rest of the world, it has isolated the United States from our allies. The Cuban dictatorship could never have withstood five decades of free trade, free markets, and free enterprise. That's a conjecture and uh, stated pretty strongly. I also want, Mr. Chairman, to, to read uh, a recent, or from a recent press release that uh, the diaz Ballard brothers, Lincoln and Mario, who represent Cuban-American community mainly in and around Miami, uh, and they were talking about uh, something that President Obama said uh, during his inaugural address on January 20th, and let me quote from President Obama. To those who cling to power through corruption and deceit and the silencing of dissent, know that you are on the wrong side of history, but that we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench the fist. And that ends the quote. Uh, United States uh, policy of state says the liberation of all political prisoners the legalization of all political parties, independent labor unions and the press, and the scheduling of free internationally supervised elections uh, is what we treasure in United States law in regard to uh, dealing with, with a country like Cuba. Uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Bastian first. The Castro regime confiscated many businesses and their intellectual property, such as trademarks, when they took over power and claimed they now own those properties. Now, for those who would say, well, we're trading with China, and this is a communist regime, uh, I don't know that China has ever taken over or confiscated any American property, U.S. property, uh, and done what Cuba did uh, shortly after the Castros took over. How does the United States address trade policy with countries that do not honor property rights? How should we deal with Cuba regarding our company's intellectual property, given the profits Cuba has made selling confiscated property of former Cuban companies? Mr. Bastian. Thank you, Congressman. I, I think this was something which I tried to uh, refer to earlier, and these are some of the issues that, that, we, that we absolutely need to get resolved, and, and we are familiar with, with the issues or the specific examples, I think, that, that, that uh, you are leading, alluding to. So the, these are the types of issues. I think this is what m uh, makes, it, it, it's quite a step. It's a, it's a long step from saying, okay, well, we're going to do this. We're going to establish these commercial relations with Cuba, make it reciprocal, and then clean up a lot of these issues that we have to deal with. Um, and uh, a lot of pressure to do that. Um, well, obviously, it is complicated. And let me, let me just quickly ask Mr. Borman. Uh, BIS is working on a regulatory change to implement the directive to permit license exceptions for don donations of personal communication devices to Cuban citizens, but not to the Cuban government. How do we ensure that the dono those donations are not confiscated or redirected to the government? What items fall under the personal communication device definition? Well, again, because these will be donated um, often by relatives, I think it will become very quickly apparent if the Cuban government changes its current policy and starts confiscating these types of things from individuals. And we have the flexibility in our regulatory scheme to change that if, if, it, if it turned out that was the case. Sure. Well, I'm about to run out of my time, Mr. Chairman, but I, I, I would just say I agree with, with President Obama and the statement that he made at his inauguration. Uh, 
we need to see an unclenched fist, and I don't know that we're seeing that. And I, this, this business of saying, well, we're the only country, all the other Western Hemispheric countries are trading and, and getting this economic advantage by trading with, with Cuba. Uh, that's, uh, that's trying to say, well, the end justifies the means. And, you know, I think we've got a matter of principle here. Uh, and I do agree with the D.I.S. Ballard brothers and Ileana Ross Layton and others who represent Cuban Americans who have suffered and their families are continued suffering under this brutal communist uh, dictatorship 90 miles from our shore. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes for questioning of the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for holding this very timely hear hearing, and uh, thanks for thanks to our witnesses for appearing today. I represent uh, the Tampa Bay area in Florida. Uh, my hometown of Tampa has extensive historic family and economic ties to Cuba. Uh, prior to the revolution, there was very robust. Uh, trade and travel. There were ferries that ran from the port of Tampa to, to Cuba. Cattle shipments left uh, the port of Tampa and many other agricultural products. Uh, so the Tampa area has a great interest in modernizing the relationship. Uh, and President Obama's announcement was greeted with great enthusiasm by uh, Cuban American families in my hometown and, and across the state. Um, Travel agents now are absolutely overwhelmed. They don't know, they can't keep up with the requests from family members to travel. And it, it uh, the, the bureaucratic barrier uh, that was previously in place was, was really a, a shame. My office deals with these, the family uh, travel requests on a, on a routine basis and the stories of, of uh, dying grandparents where uh, family members now would like to go see them. I've ha I had one case uh, of a bone marrow uh, transplant. The the only the sister was in the United States. The brother was there. She was the only match, and she had to go through all these these bureaucratic hurdles to to get there. But there's another uh, bureaucratic hurdle in place now, and I hope that you all can help. Uh, currently, there are only three airports in the United States that can. Uh, that are permitted to to um, service charter flights or any air air flight, uh, any air travel, Miami, New York, and L.A. Meanwhile, Central Florida ha probably has the highest population of Cuban Americans uh, outside Miami, and we have uh, requested uh, the Treasury and Commerce to help us uh, quickly with getting another airport, Tampa International, or, or some of the others approved on an expeditious basis, can you help? Uh, I know this is an OFAC issue, but this is, it seems to be directly uh, consistent with President Obama's direction. The problem is that, that these families really shouldn't be subjected to, to a longer waiting period or additional cost having to travel to, to Miami just to get to the island. We are in receipt of your letter to Secretary Locke. And after looking at it, it's become apparent to us that it's really the Department of Homeland Security uh, Customs and Border Protection Unit that has the principal responsibility. So we have already reached out to them and made them aware. You know, of that's interest. very interesting because we've talked to the Department of Homeland Security and they said, no, this is Treasury. <laughs> and they can't, you know, this is the people hate this sure. about government, um, right. the, you know, passing the buck. Where do we need to, where do we need to go to get this? this taken care of. How you, I'm asking for your help as these we, families wait in line to, to try to see their family members. As I said, in, in looking at the response that we would develop to the letter, it, it's become clear to us that it's DHS, but it will take the responsibility of making sure the right agency comes back to you with that question and deals with that issue. Because don't you agree this is something, this is consistent with President Obama's direction and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to just have LA, New York, and Miami where we have, when we have other uh, cities across the country that are ready, willing, and able to, to handle uh, travel. Yes, I'll take the nodding. As it, as that it makes yes. Sense. <laughs> Let me just, uh, we will take a look at it. You know, keep in mind in particular that we have one of your Tampa sons is maybe, assuming everything goes 
well up here will be our undersecretary. I'm sure he will share your fervor and, and zeal in getting this resolved. So That's right, Mr. Chairman. The um, A native son of Tampa has been nominated to serve as the uh, Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade, Frank Sanchez, and he's outstanding, and I look forward to an opportunity for you, you two to, to get together. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to the same opportunity. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. All right. Uh, the Chair now will entertain, well, uh, the Chair will now, uh, if our witnesses will continue to be with us, the Chair will uh, uh, authorize a second round of questioning. I uh, will give each member an additional three minutes to uh, ask a question. So in that regard, the chair recognizes himself for three minutes. Uh, <clears throat> are either of you familiar with the uh, report that, that was uh, issued uh, by the ranking member of uh, the Committee on Foreign Relations, uh, Senator uh, Luger, Richard Luger, the ranking Republican member. Are any of you familiar with that report? I've read it. You read it? Okay. Uh, and are you familiar uh, with um, his comments or uh, in conclusion of this report on page 11? And I want to read it just for a reference here. In hindsight, the U.S. Embargo has not served a national security agenda since Cuba ceased to be an, an effective, effective threat to the security of the United States. In the immediate post-Cold War era, the cost of maintaining this policy was negligible in comparison to the domestic political benefit derived from satisfying Cuban American groups in the U.S. The USG justified the embargo policy as an incentive or inducement for negotiation with the Cuban government, the rationale being that the U.S. would lift the embargo or parts of it in response to reform of human rights and democracy. This narrow approach, however, was not further, uh, has not furthered progress in human rights or democracy in Cuba, and it has come at the expense of other direct and regional strategic U.S. interests. Today it is clear that a reform of our policy would serve security and economic interests in managing migration effectively and combating the illegal drug trade, among other interests. Uh, and the, it goes on and on and on. And I want to uh, ask uh, unanimous consent that uh, Senator Luger's report uh, be, uh, of February the 23rd, 2009, be entered into the record without objection, so ordered. Uh, do you have uh, any response to the Luger report, uh, Mr. Mormon? Have you? had a chance to see it, and what are, you, what are some of your commentary, your reactions to that report? Well, I, I have read it. Um, I have to say I don't, I don't have any commentary on it. Um, I think this is something that uh, the, the folks in the administration that are looking at Cuba policy at large, uh, I, I think, would be looking at in, in conjunction with a, a variety of other inputs on the Cuba policy. But um, we, we at the Department of Commerce have not been specifically tasked to, to review that and come up with response. The uh, ITA administrator is an advocate for U.S. businesses all over the world. In your experience, what sort of protections and assurances do people expect from the U.S. government when operating overseas? And is, uh, should American companies expect that same sort of uh, support if and when they do business with Cuba? Mr. Chairman, the, the uh, International Trade Administration particularly through our U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service, where we've got a network of over 100 offices across the United States and about that same number, I think, overseas abroad, uh, provides a number of services for the information gathering, putting buyers and sellers together, finding agents and representatives for, for uh, U.S. firms. Um, th these are all services which we would certainly have, uh, we'd make available to uh, U.S. companies uh, you know, should this situation change, and keeping in mind that at the moment the embargo precludes us from, from doing uh, anything with the uh, U.S. business community in, in, in so far as, as Cuba is concerned. But we do have the ability to react and react quickly to changing situations. 
um, whether it is something that comes about as a change in an economic situation or political situation or a natural disaster, reacting to hurricane destruction, things of that nature. Yeah, we can do that pretty quickly. Uh, the, the chair has run out of time. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Rodonovan, for three minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a qu one question for either member of the panel um, regarding business in Cuba. Uh, there was testimony that will be given during this uh, committee hearing that 500 international companies represented in Cuba and many uh, with substantial investment there. However, according to the State Department, the business environment is so unfriendly that the number of joint ventures dropped from 540 in 1982 to 287 in 2005. Because of the government's recentralization efforts, it is estimated that one joint venture and two small cooperative production ventures have closed each week since the year 2000, and foreign direct investment dropped from 448 million in, 2000, in the year 2000 to, 30, to 39 million in 2001 and to zero in 2002. Are these 500 international companies independently owned or are they joint ventures? If they are joint ventures, why the difference between the State Department figures and your testimony? Not your testimony, but the testimony that we've heard before the committee. Maybe you can comment on, on is the, does the business climate work in Cuba for companies, international companies that are doing business there? A lot of the information that we have is anecdotal, as I mentioned before, because we, we don't go out and collect information on Cuba, mm -hmm. and we don't spend too terribly much time talking to our colleagues in, in other governments about their companies' experiences. We usually have other things we want to talk to them about. Right. Um, but I, anecdotally, I think the answer is it's not the easiest place in the world to do business, um, and we are aware of... of whether they're joint ventures or direct investment, but everything's a joint venture of some sort, mm -hmm. um, th that have failed, uh, or for the foreign partners, certainly uh, what you got going in is not what you expected to, to find. So there, there's a lot of that. And again, not to beat that horse to death, but it goes back to the kinds of issues that you're interested in uh, and the, the non-tariff uh, types of obstacles that exist. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you, Mr. Bastian. Mr. Borman, any comment? No, I have nothing to add to that. All right. Thank you very much. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chair now recognizes Mrs. Castor for five minutes, for three minutes, rather. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, the, the President Obama's announcement and the, the White House document that followed was very specific when it came to telecom companies. Uh, any telecom uh, company in this country, what, what should they be doing now uh, to, to um, investigate uh, economic opportunities? I don't, we haven't had any reaction from the Cuban government yet on, on you know, what's happening. I'll tell you quite honestly, uh, I've had, if you had asked me this question Friday at 3 o'clock, I would have said I, no company has called me on this yet. To give you an indication, at, at about 3.05 I did get my first phone call. Um, and they weren't interested in the specific opportunity or condition of the market as they were, what's just the general likelihood that this will happen at some point in time? And I think you'll probably find that there are a number of companies that probably already got some market research that they've collected through. Uh, other sources, most of them outside the United States. I, I've heard, uh, I've been contacted as well, and just the people want to understand the process. That That's a, absolutely right. Uh, so it's, uh, right now we're waiting to see what the next step from the Cuban government is. Correct. Is that correct? And yes, there's no organized effort uh, at Commerce. Uh, there might be Maybe our next panel <clears throat> would have some information on that, but as of right now, Commerce doesn't have a strategy, but, but uh, telecom companies should stay tuned. And well, no, they can contact us and, and our part because we can talk to them about what specific licensing requirements would be and how to coordinate that with, with Treasury because, again, for us, if they, if they are looking at opportunities that would involve the export of hardware or software or technology, 
that's what's covered by us. The financial arrangement part of it would be covered by Treasury. But that, that's what we can tell them about what, how we would deal with an application for some kind of transaction. As Mr. Bastian said, the other part is what the Cuban government will do because somehow all the telecom providers will have to deal in some way with the Cuban government. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. But, Thank but you. But they should definitely contact us. Great. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. Uh, Dr. Gurgi is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, as we've heard in the testimony and, and some of the question in regard to uh, opening up trade to Cuba more so than we currently have done and that uh, it would maybe increase um, human rights and, and be more effective than, than the embargo has been. And yet uh, we're, we've negotiated a trade agreement uh, with Colombia, uh, a country not too terribly far from, from Cuba, uh, that that is working very closely with that. I think it's a fair statement to say that President Uribe uh, is a friend of the United States and has done uh, an outstanding job uh, in dealing with the FARC and trying to uh, abide by every request that uh, our Congress has made regarding labor relations, and uh, I think they've made great progress, and, and yet here we've been sitting on a trade agreement, bilateral trade agreement with Colombia, uh, for over two years. Uh, and it's not just about trade and the importance of, of having that uh, bilateral relationship and open our markets uh, to them and theirs to us, but it's a huge security issue. And why we would take our eye off that ball and all of a sudden focus it on Cuba, uh, where we don't have a friend uh, in the Castros, and the amount of trade we're talking about I don't think compares to uh, Colombia. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to hear uh, both of your thoughts in regard to that. Why, why, why take our eye off uh, the main main issue in regard to dealing and and ratifying that bilateral trade agreement with Colombia uh, and focus on on Cuba. Maybe we can walk and chew gum at the same time. But go ahead and comment on that. I appreciate it. I think the issues are, are, are maybe at first blush they they appear to be somewhat similar, but I I, I don't think they are. I think there's a huge uh, the, emo there are emotional issues and political issues and social issues when you come to deal with, with Cuba. Um, that is, in particular, I, th I think on the emotional and political side, the issues are different than they, than they are with Colombia. I, I do agree with you that uh, President Uribe has made excellent strides in, 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 in trying to get uh, that agreement through and to try to accommodate the United States. I think it's clearly a discussion, though, that uh, will be held between uh, Uribe's administration, the president himself, because he, he does get involved. Uh, by that, I mean President Uribe, because he does personally get involved in these, and uh, Ambassador Kirk at the U.S. Trade Representative's office uh, to, to move this ahead. Trade agreements are really in Mr. Bastian's favor, <laughs> so I, I have nothing to add to his comments. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The chair, thanks, the gentleman. The chair now uh, want to uh, again thank the witnesses for appearing before us today. You have, uh, with your narrow perspective, and I do respect the fact that your perspective had to be narrow because it could not enter into policy areas which is not your purview and have not been clearly defined by uh, the Obama administration as of yet. So we, I certainly appreciate your uh, uh, being with us to give us this narrow perspective as it relates to uh, your jurisdiction. Uh, we want to, again, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, subcommittee hearing. And we ask now that uh, the panel, uh, the first panel is dismissed. And thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now calls the second panel uh, to the...
a desk. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, the outstanding uh, witnesses on this second panel. Uh, and uh, to my left, your right, uh, we have with us Ms. Adrian Sheed, is that correct? Sheed Rothkopf. Uh, Ms. Rothkopf is the Vice President of the Western Hemisphere Affairs uh, Division of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and next to Ms. Rothkopf, we have with us Mr. Jeff Thaley. Is that how? Thale, I'm sorry. Mr. Jeff Thale, who is the program director for the Washington Office on Latin America. And uh, next to Mr. Thale is Mr. Kirby Jones. And Mr. Jones is the president of the U.S. Cuba Trade Association. And uh, next to Mr. Jones, uh, to his uh, right, uh, left rather, would be Ambassador James Kaysen. <clears throat> Ambassador Kaysen is the president of the Center for Free Cuba, and he's the former principal officer, chief of mission for U.S. Interest Section in Havana. want to welcome all of you witnesses and it is the practice of this subcommittee, a new practice, I might add, to sway in the witnesses. So I would ask that you stand and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please let the records reflect that all witnesses have answered in the affirmative and have taken their seats. Uh, we will allow you five minutes uh, for the purposes of opening statements. And we'll begin with you, Mrs. Roscoff. Thank you. Please put a mic close to you and make sure that it's on. Is your mic on? Thank you. We applaud the recent moves by both Congress and the Obama administration to ease the embargo on Cuba. The Chamber sees recent bipartisan legislation and statements by the administration as important first steps toward a policy more likely to promote a transition to democracy and full civil liberties in Cuba and bring significant economic opportunities to American farmers, businesses, and workers. But ultimately, what we would like to see is an end to the embargo, which we view as one of the biggest foreign policy failures of the past half century. Rather than encouraging Cuba to democratize, the embargo has helped prop up the communist regime. Instead of isolating Cuba from the rest of the world, it has isolated the United States from our allies. Our two countries are natural trading partners, and prior to the embargo, the United States accounted for nearly 70% of Cuba's international trade. Cuba was the seventh largest market for U.S. exporters, particularly for American farm producers. But the embargo forced Cuba to seek out new sources for its domestic consumption. Under the Trade Sanctions Reform and Export Enhancement Act of 2000, the sale of commercial agricultural exports was permitted, but with a variety of restrictions and licensing requirements, including cash and advance payments via third country banks. Despite heavy regulation, by 2004, U.S. agricultural exports to Cuba rose from less than 1 million to 392 million, 42 percent of the Cuban market. In 2008, U.S. exports to Cuba reached 718 million. Yet the majority of agricultural trade with Cuba is done by large multinational companies, as small and medium-sized exporters are deterred by the complexity of regulations. <clears throat> 
Other negative impacts on food and agricultural exports include restrictions on the ability to travel for the purpose of establishing commercial relationships and restrictions on visits from Cuban officials to confer with U.S. suppliers, inspect facilities, and discuss sanitary and phytosanitary issues. In 2001, the International Trade Commission estimated that the embargo cost U.S. exporters up to $1.2 billion annually in lost sales. While the U.S. Chamber recommends that an updated study be conducted to fully evaluate the missed opportunities, it is clear that these include agriculture. The ITC estimates that if all restrictions on trade and travel are lifted, sales in poultry, beef, and pork could rise by 25.7 to 37.8 million. Additionally, Cuba has the potential to become the top foreign market for U.S. rice. A Congressional Research Service study estimates that removing restrictions on trade would increase rice exports by 14 to 43 million. Tourism. Lifting the travel ban will create jobs in the U.S. and, and Cuban tourism industries and will have an impact on direct investment in tourism infrastructure, such as hotels, shops, cruise ship ports, airports. The ITC estimates that lifting the travel ban would increase U.S. visitors to Cuba from 171,000 in 2005 to between 554,000 and 1.1 million. Additional tourist arrivals would increase U.S. sales of agricultural goods to the island because of the increased tourist demand for food and because of higher Cuban economic growth, boosting domestic demand for high-quality U.S. food products. Machinery. As Cuba rebuilds after widespread hurricane and tropical storm damage in 2008, the island is an important potential market for construction equipment and agricultural machinery. Additionally, Cuba has a dilapidated infrastructure system. An eventual opening or reform of the Cuban economy will create opportunities for U.S.-made equipment to build the island's infrastructure. Oil. There is a natural niche for U.S. oil companies to participate in the exploration of Cuban offshore oil fields. Subsurface similarities with existing oil fields in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico would allow U.S. companies that have experience in the Gulf to mitigate complicated technical challenges in local deep water development, leading to cost, environmental, and safety efficiencies. Additionally, Cuba's proximity to the U.S. allows for a transportation cost premium for the U.S. market that would serve to moderate energy prices to the United States. At the same time, with Cuba's maritime boundary just 45 miles away from the U.S. coastline, we ought to be concerned about who and how Cuba's oil fields are being developed from an environmental standpoint, as an oil spill could mean significant environmental damage for the United States. We believe that opening trade with Cuba will bring political and economic change to the island, but establishing a commercial relationship will certainly raise legitimate business concerns on the part of U.S. companies. The Cuban government will have to provide certain guarantees and safeguards in the areas of rule of law, environmental protection, infrastructure for travel requirements, the safety environment, intellectual property protection and incentives for innovation, and labor rights. Additionally, there are important considerations regarding financing. However, these concerns should not impede a lifting of trade restrictions with Cuba. U.S. businesses can quickly and easily benefit from open trade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now the chair recognizes Mr. Thaly for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm Jeff Thale, the program director yeah. of the Washington Office on Latin America. Uh, WOOL is a human rights organization, and we look at uh, Latin America policy and the Cuba policy from the perspective of human rights. I've submitted written testimony, but here I'd just like to briefly summarize it. Um, I, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about whether, from our point of view, trade can contribute to improvement in the human rights situation in Cuba, and if so, how. And then I'd like to end by reiterating what I think you'll hear from some of my other colleagues here about the trade opportunities and investment opportunities we're losing. Um, as an organization, as an institution, we don't believe that trade by itself in Cuba or anywhere else automatically brings gains and in increases in, in democracy and human rights. But when trade is part of a broader strategy that includes diplomatic and political engagement on human rights issues, and when there are internal and domestic pressures for the respect of human rights, then there are possibilities to see improvements in the human rights situation. 
In the case of Cuba, we believe strongly that increased trade, increased travel and engagement can only benefit the human rights situation in Cuba and bring benefits to the United States as well. Um, let me just say a word about the human rights situation itself. It's easy, uh, it's very tempting to view the human rights situation in Cuba from, from sort of stereotypical points of view. It's extremely important not to whitewash the very serious and very real problems. It's important not to exaggerate them as well. I think it's really clear if you look at the State Department's human rights reports, there are real restrictions on freedom of association, on freedom of speech. It's very clear that Cuba holds between 100 and 200 political prisoners, depending on how you count it. These are all clearly unacceptable violations of internationally recognized norms. The U.S. government should call on the Cubans to end that. The human rights community should. The international community should generally. At the same time, we look at human rights in the rest of Latin America, and if you look further at those same State Department reports, you won't see reports of political killings in Cuba or political disappearances or extrajudicial executions, which we see elsewhere in the region, and you won't see systematic accusations of torture, which is obviously an issue we've, we've looked at in the Guantanamo con context here. So I think from our point of view, it's important to see the mixed bag you see in Cuba on the human rights situation. If you ask about the United States' ability to influence the human rights situation in Cuba itself, I think from our point of view, our ability is non-existent. Uh, we've had 50 years of an embargo, almost 50 years of an embargo, little trade with some narrow exceptions, limited contact, limited diplomacy, and the result is we have very little influence and very little leverage. Cuba is free to ignore our views on human rights because we don't make much significant difference to the government or its economy or its politics or its diplomacy. And so our view is that engagement would change that. By engaging through trade, by engaging through travel, by engaging through diplomacy, we'll develop relationships in Cuba over time and we'll develop tools over time that can be used to dialogue with and to encourage greater respect from the Cuban government over human rights and democratic practices. And I don't think that's a magical formula. We're not going to see change overnight. We're not going to see dramatic steps from t today to tomorrow. But it's clearly a better strategy to pursue engagement, including trade, travel, and diplomacy, than it is to continue the current embargo. And um, I think it's important to underscore that's a point of view that most of the world believes. Uh, Latin America, Europe, Asia, Africa, most of the Middle Eastern countries all engage with Cuba. Some key allies and partners of ours, especially Brazil and, um, and the Spanish government, systematically engage with the Cuban government on trade issues and link that to dialogue on human rights, democracy issues, political prisoners. And again, I don't think they expect dramatic change overnight. They see themselves as laying the groundwork, as preparing for the future, and as developing relationships there. And the truth is the United States is standing on the sidelines. Um, and we're standing on the sidelines at a time when we have economic reasons to engage with Cuba. Um, you know, as, as, as Ms. Roth, Ms. Rothkoff noticed, uh, mentioned, as I assume Mr. Jones will mention as well, there are agricultural interests and agricultural possibilities in Cuba. Uh, there are interests from our ports in the Gulf Coast. There are tourism and travel interests. There are medical interests and medical opportunities. There are potential energy interests. There's a whole set of economic opportunities that we're foregoing for the sake of a policy that's not bringing us any real benefit in terms of human rights and democracy. So I think our view is that we ought to move toward a policy of engagement, that that policy ought to include moving toward ending our embargo on trade and taking advantage of the opportunity that brings us there. We're pleased to see that President Obama has taken the first initial steps in that process. We're pre pleased, Mr. Chairman, to see that you traveled to Cuba recently, engaged in the beginnings of dialogue and diplomacy here. We hope we'll move forward in that way because we think it's good for human rights in Cuba as well as good for the United States. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Jones uh, for the five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here as well. For the last 47 years, the cornerstone of U.S. policy toward Cuba has been the embargo. But if one looks at the original and subsequent reasons for this policy, it is hard, if not impossible, to point to a single success that this policy has had in achieving any of its objectives. The embargo has achieved, in fact, the exact opposite of what was originally intended and is not serving the interests of the United States government nor of the United States citizens. No other country in the world has an embargo on Cuba. I have been traveling back and forth to Cuba for 35 years, and I have seen a lot of changes in those years. It may be that the U.S. policy has been stuck for 47 years, but Cuba has not. 
A new trade and investment economy has emerged in Cuba the last 15 years, a mix of capitalism and socialism, and not just a little dose of capitalism. Every sector in Cuba now has a foreign private investor. This includes mining, energy, hotels, beer, bottled water, port management, cosmetics, biotechnology, real estate, agribusiness, and telecommunications, just to name a few. Cuba has removed subsidies from almost all its former state enterprises and merged or eliminated ministries. To undertake its foreign business, Cuba has created dozens of freestanding holding companies. Where once totally dependent on sugar, Cuba has greatly diversified its source of revenues now to include nickel exports, personal services, tourism, foreign remittances, citrus and seafood exports, worldwide sales of rum and cigars, and exports of biotechnology products. Whatever adjectives serve those who continue to want us to believe that Cuba is on the brink of economic collapse, the reality is otherwise. Having said that, like all developing countries, Cuba does have many problems. Major foreign debt obligations, foreign currency exchange regulations are shifting, domestic pricing policies for imported consumer food products have, have inhibited market growth, labor regulations need improvement, transparency regarding foreign investment is a longstanding concern, and limits are placed on entrepreneurial expansion. But Cuba is also the largest country in the Caribbean, with a size comparable to Pennsylvania. According to both CIA and the Economist Intelligence Unit, Cuba has had growth rates of 10.2 percent annually from 2005 to 2007. This has fallen to 4.4 percent in 2008 due to the worldwide recession and devastating hurricanes. Largely unknown is that Cuba has the third largest deposits of nickel in the world and is the ninth largest tourist destination in the Americas without any Americans. I first met Fidel Castro in 1974. I have known him now for 35 years. All of these changes in the way Cuba now does business were initiated under Fidel Castro, but are now not dependent on him or Raul Castro for they have already implemented much of the very transition that some still say would come only after Castro no longer heads Cuba. To wait to lift the embargo for some so-called post-Castro era, as if all will change and somehow different, is not at all a productive business plan, nor, quite frankly, is it a productive political strategy either. After 40 years of no trade and just over a bit over seven years, the U.S. now supplies as as has been mentioned several times, more food to Cuba than any other country. In 2008, U.S. companies received $718 million from the sale of agricultural products to Cuba. In aggregate, since this trade began, contracts for more than 11 million metric tons worth over $3.6 billion, including shipping and services, have been signed, comprising 300 different products including wheat, rice, corn, soybeans, tomato sauce, eggs, chicken, cookies, apples, wine, ground turkey, chewing gum, utility poles, live cattle, organic fertilizer, and rice. These have been bought from 157 different companies from 37 states. 23 different ports have been used for more than 1,100 sh ship journeys, of which 73.5% have been made with U.S. owned or chartered vessels. But U.S. companies are forced to operate under a serious disadvantage in comparison to companies from other countries. The rulings in early 2005 by the previous administration have caused Cuba to cut back on some imports from the United States. Most important in preventing U.S. companies from the full realization of their current trade has been and is the inability to offer private credits. There are some who argue that this restriction should be maintained because they feel Cuba is a bad credit risk. But whether or not to extend private credit to Cuba should be a decision taken by each company, not by the U.S. government. If these restrictions, unique in international commerce, were lifted, Pedro Alvarez, chairman and CEO of Alamport, which imports all U.S. agricultural products to Cuba, has stated that U.S. firms could provide over 50 percent of Cuba's food needs, which annually reach almost $2 billion, which would be an increase of several hundred million dollars a year over current levels. There have been studies that indicate that U.S. firms have lost over $100 billion since the early 60s because of the embargo, and that the annual cost now could be as high as $4 billion a year.
In my opinion, the key to starting a process of business with Cuba which will benefit American workers in the U.S. economy will be for Congress to pass and for the President to sign H.R. 874 and S-428, which will allow all Americans to travel to Cuba. Two million Americans are projected to visit Cuba in the first two years of open travel. Studies have shown that this, in turn, would result in an injection of $1.6 billion into the U.S. travel and support service industry, and most of that helping the small to medium-sized travel agents, airlines, additional food exports to feed the U.S. visitors, and advertising and promotional programs. Virtual, any, virtually anything that Cuba now purchases might very well be purchased from the United States. In this list of potential products, I am including fertilizers and pesticides, pharmaceutical products, textiles and apparel, steel, farm machinery and construction equipment, power generation machinery, electronics, plastics, tires and sporting goods. Services such as air transportation, maritime transportation, construction service, telecommunications and travel and tourism and, of course, a growth in the importation of U.S. agriculture. Would you please summarize your statement, please? U.S. firms will be able to offer what companies from Europe, Canada, and Latin America can, can, can never provide. And finally, in addition to sales, there would be several opportunities for investment, agribusiness, hotels, marinas, golf resorts, um, housing and building renovation, telecommunications, and overall infrastructure. Uh, these are just some of the opportunities that will be open. I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes Ambassador Kaysen. Ambassador Kaysen, you're recognized for five minutes, more or less. Okay. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss this topic of great importance. Until very, until very recently, I was a career foreign service officer with 38 years experience, mostly in Latin America. One of my postings was to Cuba, where I was chief of mission from two th late 2002 to late 2005. I'm speaking here today as president of the Center for a Free Cuba, a nonpartisan NGO and a 501c3 organization, and therefore nothing I say here today supports or opposes any bill before Congress, and we administer a USAID grant. We at the Center for a Free Cuba provide humanitarian assistance to the people of Cuba and assist civil society and democratic activists there. We send uncensored information and shortwave radios, among other things, to Cuba. The Center favors licensing measures announced by the President that will allow U.S. firms to attempt to enter the Cuban telecommunications market. Havana limits its citizens' access to the Internet, cell phones, and other information, or media out of its control. If Cuba expands the speed and availability of the Internet, lowers the exorbitant cost of Internet cafes, Cubans will communicate faster and more easily among each other and with the wider world. Greater access to and use of the Internet by average Cubans, especially the young, will promote civil society and the democratic process there. We support Cuban-American travel to the island on humanitarian grounds and travel by researchers, academics, and others who make a serious effort to discover for themselves Cuba's reality. We are opposed to tourist travel by American citizens with no relatives on the island because such travel will only provide funds to the Cuban security apparatus which owns the tourist infrastructure. Such bathing suit tourism will do nothing for Cubans, nor will it in any way help promote democracy. Mr. Chairman, I would like now to ask that a recent paper I wrote entitled The Case Against Travel to, be, to Cuba be entered into the record. Uh, hearing no objections, so order. Thank you very much. Just as we oppose unprincipled tourist travel to Cuba, we do not feel that a unilateral ending of what remains of the embargo now will promote greater economic or political freedom in Cuba or great benefit to American companies. Lech Valesa and Havel told the center recently that nowhere in the world have authoritarian regimes changed their ways because of trade or tourism. It has been international solidarity, constant pressure, and tangible and moral support for democratic freedom fighters that have made the difference. When the Castros are gone, the embargo will serve as leverage in helping the military owners of hotels realize it is in their interest to support a democratic opening. For if they do, we can provide millions of tourist dollars and trade opportunities. As the Washington Post has recently editorialized, giving away what little leverage we have for nothing now will gain us nothing and will harm those fighting for change on the island. Please note, that all the rest of the world trades and allows travel to Cuba, but that not, has not made any difference in the totalitarian nature of the regime. As long as Cuba refuses to allow independent labor unions the right to exist, 
we oppose U.S. businesses entering into joint venture arrangements with the Cuban government. Havana exploits workers and takes 95% of what joint venture partners pay the government for labor. Strikes are not permitted, and many independent labor organizers have been given long prison sentences. To invest in Cuba today is to participate in the exploitation of defenseless Cuban workers. And I would not be surprised if after freedom comes to Cuba, there's a backlash against Canadian, Spanish, and other investors who have taken advantage of docile Cuban labor to make a fast buck. American farmers are privileged in their dealings with Cuba. They get cash and take no credit risk. As we've heard, we are the largest food provider to Cuba. Why would any agribusiness exporter want to give credit to Cuba? Why would American citizens support such a measure when Cuba is an international deadbeat? It has defaulted many times and owes foreign creditors over $25 billion, not to mention another $22 billion of unpaid Cold War era debt. Its economy is moribund and it is in arrears everywhere. Per capita, Cuba owes $4,000 each. Its debt equals 86% of GDP. It's the 10th most indebted country in the world and its Moody, Moody's credit rating is CAA1, speculative grade, very poor. Dun & Bradstreet rate Cuba as one of the riskiest economies in the world. I would note that Cubans' average monthly wage is around $20. The average Cuban lacks money for most necessities. U.S. food goes largely to the tourist industry or is marked up 256% and sold to those who receive remittances in dollar stores. There is no consumer demand for our products and no prospects in sight for this to change until the regime begins to pursue free market economic policies. There are no Cuban entrepreneurs, no free market policies, no economic opportunity, and no purchasing power. There's just the regime which resists change in a panicky attempt to maintain total power for the nomenclature. Reuters reported last week that there is a severe cash crunch in Cuba and foreign businessmen fear Cuba could be near insolvency. The liquidity crisis has become critical. Small foreign businesses are reportedly desperate and are not being paid. State companies have been ordered to stop all imports. Prices and demand for all Cuban exports are down and nothing suggests Cuba's economy will get any better soon. Now, recent polls conducted in Cuba reveal that only 6% there of the citizens see the embargo as a problem. What they most want is for the government to give them a better life, a decent job, hope for the future. They say they want change, democracy, and economic freedom. They want elections. They want to join the world. They want to be able to travel and run their own businesses in Cuba. Whether the U.S. trades more with Cuba is irrelevant to their lives. The Center for a Free Cuba opposes any loosening of restrictions on commerce with Cuba now for the following five reasons. Trade and tourism will not hasten a democratic transition there. Cuba is a terrible credit risk and cannot pay most of its bills. It exploits its workers shamelessly. It's an insignificant market for U.S. consumer and other goods. And only the government, not the people, benefits from trade with us. There are no Cuban exporters or entrepreneurs. Mr. Chairman, only if and when a new Cuban leadership demonstrates through deeds, not words, as the President has said, that it is moving toward democracy and market freedoms, then we will be among the first to say, let's deal. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify here today. The Chair, the chair thanks the gentleman. The Chair recognizes himself for five minutes for questioning. <clears throat> the U.S. has a long history of trading with numerous nations with poor records on human rights and shoddy uh, business uh, and credit relationships. The list is very, very long. Uh, we import considerable amounts of oil from Nigeria, from Venezuela, despite their shoddy records on human rights and political freedom. Pakistan itself is the recipient of billions of dollars in American aid, despite Islamabad's long history of repressing political freedom. Indeed, at one point, the United States traded with Iraq, even during the height of Saddam Hussein's uh, brutality against Kurdish in Shiite uh, communities. Yet despite our long and continued history of doing business with nations with questionable or even poor records on human rights, and I might add China is a glaring example of this, uh, this nation of Cuba has been singled out for a trade embargo because of its human rights issues and problems. Is there a double standard 
and why is there a double standard? Ms. Roscoff, would you please respond to my question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. The U.S. Um, does, does have a um, history of engaging with many countries around the world in which human rights problems exist or political prisoners are unjustly deprived of their freedoms. Um, and we have chosen another path, engagement. Um, from China to Saudi Arabia, from North Korea to Afghanistan, we choose to engage to help advocate for those who have been abused by their systems. Engaging brings more of these stories to light. Um, engagement brings countries more fully into the international community where established systems and multilateral mechanisms can work on behalf of the victims. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that the embargo has failed to help the political prisoners in Cuba, and it's actually hurt the average Cuban by damaging the economy. But it hasn't damaged it enough to change things in the mind of the governments. It's just damaged it to hurt the innocents in the country. So I, I do say, yes, we have had a double standard. Mr. Thau, um, should we subject some of these other countries to uh, similar embargoes? Should we stop importing oil from Venezuela or Nigeria or even Saudi Arabia? Should we uh, issue a trade embargo with China? And what would the effect of that be uh, to, to the economy of our nation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's actually a really good question. I think it's a good question because it underscores the extent to which we ought to we ought to strive to have a single standard in how we approach trade and human rights and diplomacy issues around the world. I think our view is, is that there are limited selective occasions where sanctions do make sense. I think by and large sanctions haven't been effective forms of coercion against governments with, with whom we have disagreements. I think Cuba is one of the clearest examples of that. And I think the message is we ought to engage with countries and as part of that engagement have human rights on the explicit agenda. We ought to do that with Cuba, we ought to do it with China, and we ought to do it around the world. Perspective on the possibility of the uh, president's recent pronouncement as it relates to the telecommunications industry. How do you foresee that uh, from, from two vantage points? One from the vantage point of the American corporations and two from the vantage point of the Cuban people. Um, first, just a minor point, American cell phones won't work in Cuba. So we could send all the cell phones we want but it's not going to do any good. I mean, it ignores the fact that Cuba has a 12-year a now joint venture with Italy, which, has a, which is in the process of redoing the whole telecommunications system in Cuba. They've launched a cell phone system. It doesn't cover the entire country and covers the major population centers. Um, there's been installations of public phones and an up, upgrade of telephone communications hardware. So U.S. companies are going into a market where there already is a foreign investor. Uh, sometimes we tend to think if we're not there, nobody's there. But that's not, in the, that's not the case in Cuba. Um, uh, having said that, I've talked to Cuban officials who recognize that we're a million Americans to come to Cuba in, in, in free travel. They're going to have to make changes so that they can uh, service Americans and their cell phones which will mean um, uh, a joint venture between some American company and Etexa and the Italian company there to widen the cell phone coverage, um, to engage in a, in a business agreement and finances going back and forth for the expansion of that coverage, and uh, to install a system where U.S. cell phones will work. Uh, but again, American companies will be going into a situation that has been working for 12 years. My time is up. I want to recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Case, and, and welcome to you and everybody else here to the committee. I do have a question regarding your testimony. You mentioned in your testimony a Reuters report that Cuba may be in a uh, 
fiscal crisis and near insolvency at top of the fact on on top of the fact that it already has 25 billion in unpaid debt and owes an additional 22 billion dollars in cold war era unpaid debts why are other countries still doing business like this Italian company with Cuba if they're not being repaid if that's indeed the case well what what Cuba's been doing um, even when I was there we saw it all the time they they will uh, take products from foreign countries they will wait as long as they can to pay them and pay them a little bit or try to restructure the debt. They did that with Mexico, for example. Uh, it's a constant sort of kiting in the sense that uh, they just don't they have so much debt and so little productivity and so little of what they export that's not already being sold that they don't have the money they need to provide for all these great markets that people have been talking about. Uh, the fact is they, they're tremendously, tremendously indebted. Uh, there is no consumer demand because the average Cuban gets no, has no money, can barely survive. So it all depends on the whims of the government. And Fidel buys for, for poli on political grounds, particularly from the United States, because he's trying to influence votes in Congress. And he, where he buys is, depends on what, uh, you know, a lot of uh, um, <clears throat> calculations he made where it's going to get the main, main bang for the buck. Thank you, but, Mr. Casey. Um, if American business, including agribusiness, were not required to accept cash-only terms of business and instead started giving credit to Cuba, what do you see happening if, uh, in, in that, under that scenario? Well, I think, he, I think any company that would want to not take cash before they even ship the goods, when all these other countries, uh, companies are having great difficulty getting money, would be nuts. I mean, they, they have the best deal going. And I think that um, uh, what would happen is we start r r running up huge debts with Cuba, and they may or may not pay us, depending on uh, like they do with the rest of the world. Can you tell me whether there would be more than credit risks involved um, if cash was not required for purchases of well, American Well, the real goods? risk is, is this is not a market that's making decisions. This is Fidel and Raul who decide who gets paid, who gets booted out. When I was there, there was a move after many years to uh, dissuade Spanish small and medium businesses from remaining. That's why in those figures we heard earlier, there's a large number of companies that have left, and it's because they decided uh, that it's time for them to go. They changed their mind. Thank you, Mr. Case. And you mentioned also in your testimony uh, a point which I would like you to elaborate on, if you would, please, and that is that uh, to invest in Cuba today is to participate in the exploitation of defenseless Cuban workers and that there would be a backlash against Canadian, Spanish, and other investors who have taken advantage of the docile, docile Cuban labor to make a fast buck. Could you yeah, expand on that, please? Uh, I've talked to a lot of people in Cuba when I was there and since then who tell me that um, when the day comes and when there's freedom in Cuba, the fact that the United States on principle did not, in, did not exploit Cuban labor uh, the, the way I mentioned it uh, will be seen as a favorable uh, development for American companies. But that the Spanish and others who have taken advantage that you can't strike, that you can't have labor organizations are going to not have the sympathy of the general public afterwards. And how that plays out, we'll have to see. And I would remind you also that um, Lech Valesa has written a letter to the president recently saying, please don't forget the situation of labor rights in Cuba when you talk about uh, changing your policy toward Cuba. And I think that's very important. All right. Thank you, Mr. Case. And Ms. Uh, Rothkopf, I, I, I couldn't help but notice in your testimony on uh, the chamber's desire to do business in Cuba that you would want to be able to do business. A couple minor things to get out of the way. That would be that uh, um, there's a long list here. The Cuban government will have to provide certain guarantees and safeguards to U.S. business in the areas of rule of law, the environmental protection, infrastructure for travel requirements, intellectual property protection, and incentives for innovation and labor rights. Uh, also, um, important considerations regarding financing. That's quite a long list. I mean, uh, um, uh, <laughs> care to comment on that? I mean, you know, that's, sure. a, that's a pretty high barrier to overcome. Sure. I think, I think the reason that that was included in my testimony was to make the point that we think that opening trade with Cuba is going to bring political and economic change to the island. But just because 
we were to open and make that option available, that doesn't mean that everybody is going to rush in and automatically do business. And I think that the important thing is to say that in we don't we don't place that limit on other countries, on businesses. Businesses will make a smart decision based on business based on business decisions and whether it makes sense for their company. A, com a company that's, that doesn't have the, the safety requirements that they need, they're gonna stop operating. If they're not getting the intellectual property protection that they need, then they're not gonna, they're not gonna continue to do business with that country. Um, if the infrastructure isn't there for, for the travel requirements, they're not gonna go in. So basically what we're saying is, U.S. businesses are successful because they take a smart look at the business opportunities. And my point is that they are going to continue to take a smart look at the opportunities and they're gonna make a smart decision based on what the Cuban government decides to do or not to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The ch Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the lady, the gentlelady from uh, Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, following President Obama's announcement that uh, lifting of the restriction on Cuban-American families and their ability to travel uh, to Cuba, there's, it's been met at home with great enthusiasm. And uh, I wanted to give you one example of a, a newspaper headline that followed within the week. Uh, it's from the Tampa Tribune, but it's, it was had a similar message in many other papers, thirst for Cuba trade and travel. And uh, I think folks at home are very, they're very hopeful for the economic opportunity uh, that uh, modernization of the relationship will bring eventually. Uh, great potential in my, my, the ports in Florida, uh, ag products, uh, all products, uh, the cruise industry, etc. But I think because of the, the, um, family ties and historic ties that we have, uh, folks do not want economic opportunity come, to come at the expense of uh, progress and change on the island, especially human rights. So now, where are we? we President Obama appeared at the Summit of the Americas and made a, another overture, uh, met rather surprisingly with a response from the Cuban president uh, that said everything's on the table, followed up by uh, Brother F Fidel Castro said, well, well, wait a minute. If you all are advising the Obama administration and uh, the Congress now on how to proceed, what is the plan? Uh, it's unlikely that it's going to come just a lifting of the embargo. That may not practically happen. So what is the plan? What what are we uh, going to be seeking on human rights improvement and where can we make progress? And if you all could each take about 45 seconds to answer. Well, I think the embargo has always been a tool and both President Bush and I think reiterated by President Obama has said that if we see evidence that the Cuban government is serious about engaging, it takes two to tango, gives us a sign and begins moving in the direction of where we want to see Cuba, which is greater freedom and economic prosperity for the Cuban people, then everything is open for discussion. But uh, Hillary Clinton said a couple days ago in a hearing that she's seen no response yet from Cuba, and Fidel keeps undercutting his, his little brother by saying he didn't mean that. He's still in control, and I think he's made it clear from day one of his administration that he, he said, when the, this war is over, I'll start a longer and bigger war of my own, the war I'm going to fight against them. I realize that will be my true destiny. He, Fidel, will continue to do everything he can to sabotage, I think, a closer engagement between the two countries. Oh, me? Okay, thank you. Um, I completely agree with you. We don't want the economic opportunities to come at the expense of the possibilities of democracy. But we actually believe that broadening economic engagement with the island through additional commercial and people-to-people -people contacts will promote the transition to democracies and to full civil liberties. Um, we very much hope to see an end to the embargo, um, absence of a full end to the embargo. There are some steps um, that can be taken, for example, removing the restrictions on financing, 
um, allowing the ability to travel for the purpose of establishing commercial relationships, um, allowing visits from Cuban officials to confer with U.S. suppliers, inspect facilities, and discuss sanitary and phytosanitary issues. All of these would all have a positive effect. Similarly, I don't expect that the process of political opening in Cuba I don't expect that the process political opening in Cuba is going to be a tit-for-tat series of movements by the United States and the Cuban government back and forth. My view is we will see political change there and political opening and relaxation as the U.S. moves forward in its relationship. I think we ought to move forward pursuing our own interests, which have to do with maintaining human rights as a concern of ours and being very clear and public about that, pursuing some common interests around migration, uh, drug cooperation and environmental concerns, and um, moving forward in, in pursuit of our economic interests. And I think in that process, we'll see change move beginning in Cuba. But I don't think we'll see it as a back and forth, tit for tat kind of process. Can I just add a couple comments? If there are preconditions, if we are gonna say to Cuba, we're not gonna do this until you do that, that means two things. That means, one, we have put into Cuba's hands how we conduct our foreign policy, because we're, we're letting them set the conditions. Secondly, it's a non-starter. Cuba will not respond to any preconditions and have said so repeatedly. Uh, president Obama did something that no other president since John Kennedy has done, which is to say publicly that the policy over 50 years has been a failure. In response to that, Raul Castro said everything's on the table, something that no Cuban president has said for 50 years. Raul Castro is president of Cuba. He has an older brother who is no, has no official office in managing the government. I think it would be a mistake to take an editorial or a column in Grandma and interpret that as being the final word on Cuban government policy. I think we ought to take them up on their word I think we, uh, there's a way to begin in terms of talking about resurrecting the bilateral talks that the previous administration stopped on immigration, drug interdiction, and the environment, all to our interest. Um, and we ought to begin the process of talking uh, in the same way that Ronald Reagan, in calling the Soviet Union the evil empire, still kept on talking. Thank you. Uh, Time is up. The chairman, I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingry, for uh, Dr. Gingry, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I want to thank all the witnesses uh, of this second panel. Uh, I happen to disagree with Ms. Rothkoff, Mr. <laughs> Thale, Mr. Jones, and do fully, completely agree with Ambassador uh, Kaysen. But that's the way life is. You have uh, your opinion, and you feel very strongly about it, and uh, we have to go on. Uh, I do want to commend uh, Ambassador Kaysen for 38 years' experience in the Foreign Service, mostly in Latin America and uh, some time in Cuba, and Chief of Mission from 2003 to 2006. I think that gives him a pretty darn good insight uh, into what's going on. And I think his comments about uh, uh, labor uh, and the problem in regard to uh, labor violations in Cuba, uh, I made the, the analogy in regard to why we didn't ratify the free trade agreement, bilateral trade agreement with Colombia, and that, the Democratic majority, uh, Mr. Chairman, it keeps blocking that, and it's mainly over, over labor issues. So it uh, seems a little uh, disingenuous that uh, we, we would be wanting to open up uh, trade uh, with Cuba when their labor record is a, a, a deplorable, abhorrent. Uh, I want to specifically ask uh, Ambassador Kaysen, though, what do you think the current credit, credit worthiness of Cuba is, and what is on the horizon that will give us faith that Cuba can afford to pay its debts? If you could quickly, in about 30 seconds, answer that, I, I would appreciate it. I think the credit it. rating is terrible. It couldn't get lower, and I don't think there's anything on the horizon that's going to bring the big bucks that would allow us to have our natural, the natural, having uh, Cuba the natural trading partner that someday it will be when Cuba is free and has the right economic policies that allow for growth and human ingenuity and entrepreneurs that are repressed there. But right now there's nothing. Uh, and um, so I think that it's uh, wishful thinking that the money will just appear and that we'll all get paid. I'd like to say that I used to 
run trade promotion for the U.S. government in, in Southern Europe. I worked for three years as the head of the trade promotion. So I'm all in favor of businesses making a buck. I'm also interested in get, them getting paid and not giving up human rights in the, in, the, in the process just to make a buck on a market that's extremely small, is shrinking, and is not going to grow other than by some miracle that I don't know where that's going to come from. Absolutely. Well, let me, let me just say this, too. I think uh, uh, the other three witnesses are, are talking about uh, the, basically what it sounds to me is the end justifies the means uh, and that uh, sanctions haven't worked. Uh, and I would, I would suggest to them that sanctions do work when they're implied across the board and maybe the people that are out of step are the other countries of the Western Hemisphere and Europe uh, that were not willing to not have the intestinal fortitude to apply the sanctions. Mr. Jones, you referenced uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. You and I are probably about the same age. We were probably in our early 20s when, uh, uh, when, when Fidel Castro allowed Nikita Khrushchev to put those uh, uh, ballistic missiles on that island 90 miles from our shore and aiming right at us. So uh, uh, I think uh, the courage was, uh, of course, on the part of uh, President Kennedy, probably spinning in his grave uh, today, uh, listening to some of this testimony. I'm not specifically asking you a question, but if you want to respond in just a second, I'll let you. Let me go on to Mr. Thale, though. There's something in your testimony, Mr. Thale, that really, really bothered me. You said that uh, to reference in the United States State Department Human Rights Report, uh, in your written testimony it says, although that report criticizes Cuba's treatment of prisoners, the State Department Human Rights Report does not allege that the Cuban government engages in torture. And then in parentheses you have an issue with which we are grappling here in the United States. And in your verbal testimony, and if you don't recall it, we can, Mr. Chairman, have the transcriber read it back to us, uh, you referenced Guantanamo Bay. Were you suggesting, Mr. Thale, that in the previous administration uh, that uh, President Bush uh, or anybody a part of that was endorsing torture, that we were torturing people? Is that what you were suggesting? Well, I was suggesting um, Mr. Gingrey, that, that there's a debate going on in the United States about the documents that have just been released. There's the whole Abu Ghraib debate. And this is an issue that's clearly under discussion uh, in the United States. And I think the general thrust of my testimony was that if you look at the human rights situation in Cuba, you see a set of serious problems which have to do, as I said, with freedom of association, freedom of the press, free expression, political prisoners. But that there's a set of in the universe of human rights issues that are under debate in the world today, there's some that Cuba is... Well, well reclaim, reclaim my time. I, I just want to say in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, that I'm getting a little weary of, of uh, people that to represent this government going around the country uh, talking about uh, what we do and, and how we're uh, guilty of, uh, of uh, human rights violations and apologizing you, for the previous administration. I think that's entirely inappropriate, and I yield back. Uh, would the gentleman yield? Of course, I'll yield to the chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. Green, you're, you're a good friend of mine, but I just want to be, bring your attention to a matter in my home state of Illinois where uh, there is a fellow by the name of John Burge, who's a former police commander. And uh, he has been recently been indicted after about 30 years for torturing uh, American citizens and forcing them to... Uh, uh, confess to crimes, and some have served for uh, many years on death row. Your friend, or uh, Republican Governor George Ryan, uh, who's also convicted now, he's a friend of mine. But one of the things that he did, I really admire for, that he freed all the prisoners on death row because uh, a lot of them were there because of torture. And so this does occur uh, in in all countries, uh, and so uh, and even in our own countries. And right now, there is a current real issue in my own state of Illinois, in the city of Chicago. You're probably not mindful of that, but I just was for the record wanted to reflect that. Thank you so much. I yield back. Uh, the time of the gentleman has expired, and uh, now we'll recognize uh, the gentleman from, who's just joined us, Mr. Scalise, who's joined us from uh, Louisiana. Mr. Scalise, uh, Scalise, you are recognized for five minutes for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would first ask a uh, comment that Mr. Jones made a few minutes ago about uh, who's calling the shots, I guess, in Cuba. I, uh, 
Uh, do you really suggest that Fidel Castro is not in some way con in control of the government of Cuba? I am suggesting that he remains as head of the Communist Party, but he is not president of Cuba. Um, there's been a whole new wave of people brought in. Does that mean that Raul Castro does not consult his older brother? Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure he does. But it, I think it would be a mistake to take his writings in grandma as necessarily reflecting the absolute position of the Cuban government. And I, I think um, just as President Obama did not take the statements of Mr. Gibbs and Mr. Restrepo, which were fairly hard line, but, um, uh, but he, he put forth a different view of what his view was in terms of the, uh, of the relationship with, with Cuba. And I think we should wait, the U.S. government should wait for the official response from Raul Castro or his ministers in terms of how they want to proceed. And, you know, I would still, I would still doubt that uh, Fidel is removed from giving orders or, or having a direct say in how the government's running. But I, I do think as we look at and debate this proposal to change U.S. policy, policy that's been in effect for decades, uh, I think we need to look at a broad range of issues, not just the economic issues, but the political issues and also the, the impact it would have on Americans who live here today who were literally run out of Cuba, uh, who, who still have very vivid memories of their property being taken, their families being threatened, in some cases detained, and, uh, and, and, and then all of the things that they escaped and what this would mean to them, the people that are contributing to our economy, who are uh, active citizens in their communities, who are business owners, and uh, who have taken offense, and, and many have expressed very publicly, the offense they would have to uh, assisting this Castro government, whether it's Fidel or Raul, uh, it, it's, it's still the Castro government that's, that's running and keeping the reins over the citizens there. I don't know if any of y'all have, have consulted the, the to different Cuban-American communities throughout our country uh, to the only thing assessment. we know, the only thing those people know is that which they, people, Wait, which people, uh, the people you, who are concerned about their property, property being confiscated and, and families and the, and the problems of the early 60s. The only thing we know after 50 years almost is that none of those problems have been solved with the current policy. They, the confiscation of property, for example, first, not a single trademark has been confiscated. There are 5,000 registered trademarks of U.S. brands in Cuba that are maintained today, and I've taken companies down to the Cuban Chamber of Commerce and other places. And, where and I register. apologize to cut you off. My time's running out. Uh, Ambassador Kaysen's had his hand up. At, did yeah, you know I think uh, the embargo was put in place, of course, originally because of confiscation of U.S. properties. Uh, Jones mentioned nickel. That was one of the properties that was seized from American, American government at the time. Um, I'd like to make the point that nobody's policies have been able to budge Fidel Castro from the course that he's been on. Fifty years, the rest of the world except us has pursued a policy of engagement and trade in tourism. My question is, where's the beef? They've been doing this for 50 years. We're the only ones that haven't. And people say, now, we should do something different and, the, and Castro will change. It's not, we don't have a magic pixie dust to make that happen. It's because this is the nature of this guy. It's too bad that nobody's policies worked. But I think when they're gone, the, what's left of the embargo will be a leverage on the military, because it's a military dictatorship. Those guys will see their vested interest in moving the country in the right direction so that we can liberate uh, the hordes of American tourists that we would like to see go there. Uh, I mean, um, for Mr. Thale and, and Ms. Rothkopf, uh, I know China, Venezuela, other countries are doing business in Cuba today. Uh, we've heard testimony about the average per capita income, uh, if you can address that uh, as well, and what types of consumers are in, uh, are in the country that, that we could even be doing business with if we went down that road. Uh, what, what types of products do, do China, Venezuela, other countries provide that, uh, that, um, that aren't available, or what are, what are they not providing where, where there even would be a role? for America to play, and then to what type of consumer base is out there? 
Well, I think the first thing that we have to think about in terms of what um, the U.S. can provide that isn't being provided by other countries is uh, to think about our proximity. And um, in, my, in my testimony, I identified um, a number of areas, including agriculture, for example. Um, Cuba has the potential to become the top foreign market for U.S. rice, for example. Um, we discussed tourism, machinery, oil. I think we talked about biotechnology. Um, there's a whole host of products that we can provide, um, uh, including agricultural products and consumer products, um, simply because we're closer, which will give us a competitive edge over. over what is the average per capita income? That was, was in that Cuba. in your testimony? The, or was that in the, Mr. Scalise, the average, um, the, I believe the average per capita, the average per capita income is about one fifth of that of the United States. So the per capita income in the United States is about $40,000 and that in Cuba is $8,8500. So cons there's no question consumer demand mm -hmm. is not what's going to drive trade between the United States and Cuba. What's going to drive demand is infrastructure, wholesale commodities, and so on. And the U.S. has, it's less about filling holes. I think there are some holes, but it's less about filling holes than it is about the comparative advantage we have because of the reduced, reduced shipping costs. And I think rice is the most single most dramatic right. example of that. Right. Time just to add is to that, um, the additional tourist arrivals, just for example, from the increased tourist demand for, um, for food, um, will will boost domestic um, domestic demand for U.S. products as well. I yield back. Chair, yeah, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, if the witness will uh, indulge us, we will go into a second round of questioning, uh, and we will ask the uh, members of the committee to restrict their uh, questions to two minutes. Um, and uh, Chair recognizes himself. Ambassador Kaysen, uh, what I see uh, that you served in Venezuela and Bolivia in, during your uh, career, uh, outstanding public of uh, public service, um, and uh, uh, have these two nations engaged in uh, any form of nationalization of their uh, of uh, of companies and uh, other entities, business entities? Uh, yes, um, mm -hmm. Bolivia. Would you, would, most recently, yeah, would you would you suggest that we uh, in, in, uh, uh, create a trade embargo around these two nations? No, I think that um, you know, if you were starting today and said, would the trade embargo, uh, uh, if we were to launch it today, would it would it change Cuba's mm -hmm. behavior? Mm -hmm. I think we would, the answer would be no, and I think we've seen. Why, why would you Why would you suggest that we continue the trade embargo against Cuba? Well, first of and, all, and, and let me ask the question, please. And uh, also, why would we also have a similar uh, practice as it relates to other countries that have uh, significant human rights violations, uh, extraordinary human rights violations in some instances? As I said or, or originally, the, the embargo was originally designed as, as a reaction to confiscation of American properties in Cuba, and it's evolved over the years. I think if you were to say what we know about the embargo today, if you started it fresh, would it, would it induce somebody like Fidel Castro to bring democracy? Like every other policy in the world, of every variation that anybody else has tried, it hasn't. So to think that ending the embargo now would somehow uh, induce Fidel Castro at this late stage in his life to become a Democrat or do any of the things that we say are our end game for Cuba, it's just not going to happen. Time is up. The chair now recognizes the uh, ranking member, Mr. Radonovich, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Jones, I have got a, do have a question for you. You testified that, that there are about 500 international companies represented in Cuba with um, a substantial investment there. Uh, but according to the State Department, the business environment is so unfriendly that the number of joint ventures dropped from 540 in 1982 to 287 in 2005. Because of the government's recentralization efforts, it is estimated that one joint venture and two small cooperative production ventures have closed each week since the year 2000, and foreign direct investment dropped from $448 million in the year 2000 to $39 million in 2001 and to zero in the year 2002. Are these 500 international companies 
independently owned or are they joint ventures? And if they are joint ventures, why the difference between the State Department figures and your testimony? Can you help bridge that? Uh, yes, I'll try. First, the joint ventures have actually have fallen even further, down to about two, 237 now. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. Cuba, when it, when it started into the joint venture business, which is 94, 95, uh, they were in a learning process. There hadn't been a single joint venture in Cuba between 1959 and 1994. They were learning how to do this. And things changed over the times, and they, and they learned what they wanted, what the country needed, which joint ventures contributed to its national economy, which they wanted to do and didn't do. And over the course of time, they began closing and not renewing and not, not uh, entertaining small to medium-sized joint ventures with a concentration on larger joint ventures of a much more st strategic and nationally important basis. For that reason, many were closed, many ended, and the people left. Those 500 companies, are, I haven't got the breakdown as to which are representatives, which are sales agents, which are uh, real estate partners. Uh, all I know is that they, they are offices there of non-U.S. companies for a variety of business reasons. So you're saying that Castro now permits wholly owned private international businesses to operate without taking a cut? Joint ventures are on a generally a 50-50 basis. There have been some 100% foreign-owned joint ventures, uh, particularly in the power generation area. Um, most of them, as I said, are 50-50, uh, where the joint venture partner and, um, and the Cuban enterprise with which it has a contract forms a board, develops a business plan, sets up a business, joint venture, the foreign partner can take its profits after taxes out of the country. Um, uh, and many, uh, particularly in the oil, mining, and some of the areas that I mentioned earlier are functioning very well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady lady from Florida, Ms. Castro, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thaley, in your testimony, you uh, state that some of the countries that currently trade with Cuba use their um, engagement to promote human rights. Provide an example for us or a few examples of what other countries that are currently trading with Cuba, Cuba are doing to promote human rights in Cuba. Thank you for the question. The two most dramatic, I think, and most high visibility examples are Brazil and Spain. And in the case of Brazil, uh, President Brazil visited Cuba last January. He pledged a billion dollars in credits for trade and investments. And uh, it's widely believed, um, including by U.S. government officials, that he began a dialogue with the Cuban political leadership about the release of political prisoners and about long-term political relaxation in Cuba itself. I think it's generally believed that uh, President Lula has continued to raise those issues in all of his and his government's subsequent interactions with Cuba. So again, I don't think Lula is expecting all 200 political prisoners to be released tomorrow, but I think that's, that's an issue on the table for the Brazilians. I think Spain, as it's led the European Union's uh, policy shift in re-engagement with Cuba has had that issue on the table as well. And I think it's fairly clear that the, um, that the release of political prisoners for, for Zapatero and the Spanish government is an important question. Again, I don't think they're going to have a sort of, we'll add a new trade deal, you'll release four political prisoners kind of thing. But I do think you've seen movement on this. And I think the historic example here, Congressman, is that if you look at, uh, if you look at the period in the year around the Pope's visit to Cuba when the Vatican, Vatican diplomacy focused on the political prisoner question. There was never any explicit deal made at all, but in that period the number of political prisoners in prison in Cuba uh, was reduced by about a third. Similarly, if you look at the period around when President Carter uh, reopened the U.S. interest section in Havana, the number of Cuban political prisoners dropped significantly. So I think the evidence is that you do see movement on these kind of issues when there's consistent engagement, when there's real interaction, and when uh, you're not looking for sort of precondition or tit-for-tat kind of concessions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Ambassador Chan Kaysen and uh, I really, and, and others, uh, the other ones, I really appreciate your, your testimony. I must say that I spent uh, 
four hours uh, in meetings with President Raul Castro, an hour and a half, and a half at the home of uh, Fidel Castro, and had uh, uh, some extensive conversations with him. And I must agree with the, uh, uh, your other witnesses, uh, Mr. Ms. Roscoff, Mr. Thale, and Mr. Jones. I certainly disagree with you. Uh, about uh, the mind of the Cuban people, the mind of Fidel Castro, and the mind of Raul Castro as it relates to normalization. Uh, I want to just uh, say that in conclusion, it was very uh, uh, informative for me, a first-time visitor to Cuba. Uh, with that, uh, the hearing is now uh, concluded. I want to thank the witnesses for your presence. Thank you for appearing before us. Uh, and this uh, hearing is now uh, adjourned. Good, good hearing. Good hearing. Yeah, you too. Oh, I'll send it to you. Oh. <laughs>